you. Well, good evening. Oh, I think you're all there. Thank you so much for coming to this uh, Penn Symposium. Um, I would like to start the meeting with uh, some prayer for the firefighters. If you're not a prayer, please just give me a moment of silence. Lord, we ask you to protect the firefighters that may have to go out tonight and the people's property that may be affected. Uh, just, just give those firefighters their best decision-making mind ever, that they can decide what to do and execute it, and that all the people would be safe that are out there. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, thank you for that. Um, my name is Darren Fowler. I'm one of the Josephine County uh, Commissioners. I got Commissioner DeYoung and Chair Commissioner Morgan there in the back. Um, and so we got 10 presenters here tonight. Um, and before we do that, let me tell you that the bathrooms are right there on the side. Um, and we're trying to make sure we're respectful and courteous. It's a big group, big room. Uh, so let the speaker speak and uh, keep the side conversations to a minimum so that we can all hear. Um, we are going to have the 10 presenters. Most likely there's one still hanging out there that may not make it, but might. Um, we're going to take a little five-minute break there and give you another chance at getting a ticket and leaving one in the glass jar for questions. And then we'll spend a half an hour asking those questions at about 7 o'clock. Um, I'm going to draw a number out or probably three of them and get some people lined up over here and I'd have you ask your question and then take a seat and listen to the answer. I don't want to start a bunch of back and forth and but wait a minute I have a third question. Um, I just want to get through as many questions as I can and if um, if you didn't get a chance to ask the question you want, there over by those agendas on that first table is a contact list, an email for each one of the presenters. And that's really what I was trying to do with this hemp symposium, is connect the people that have questions with the people that have answers and jurisdiction. And so we probably aren't going to get to the end of this subject in the next hour and a half, but we're going to start a really intelligent conversation about who has jurisdiction, who you can contact with questions, um, and maybe a chance to network with other uh, growers in the valley and find out um, from your peers uh, what is some best practices and some suggestions. And so uh, that, that's really my entire hope for this, is that you will be connected up. And then I want to be any kind of contact help I can. I got uh, my business cards over there. We have the... Uh, Commissioner's uh, email on the website. You can hit all three of us um, or hit us individually. And uh, I, we just want to get the right answers to you guys that have questions. So um, let's get to those speakers so that we are not uh, listening to me any longer. Um, our first one is from the Oregon Department of Agriculture. That's Sonny Summers. Sonny, you're up. I don't hold still well. So um, thank you all, all y'all way back there even for coming this evening. I appreciate it. And thank you for getting me out of the office today. A day on the road is better than a day in the office. So as he said, my name is Sunny Summers. I am the Oregon Department of Agriculture's Cannabis Policy Coordinator. I work both with hemp and marijuana. A lot of you may have seen me present in the past as well. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk specifically about hemp and how the department regulates it. I'm going to keep it brief so that uh, 10 speakers, that's quite the, um, quite the list we have going on this evening. So for the Department of Ag, when the state legislature passed uh, statutes around hemp and marijuana, this is an agricultural crop as determined by the state legislature. And so for our purposes, we try to treat it the same as we would any other agricultural crop. Keeping in mind, this is slightly different, obviously, in that we have to register growers and handlers. And I'll talk about that further in the next slide. But for ODA's purposes, we have regulatory authority over pesticides, food safety, Ag water quality, which is different than what Oregon Water Resources is going to talk about. Ag water quality is your ag activities cannot impact waters of the state, be it from 
fertilizer or pesticide runoff or erosion because you put a road into the back 40 and you didn't build it correctly, you can't impact those waters of the state. And we have ag water quality specialists centered throughout the state. Uh, anything you sell or get paid for in weight has to be on a scale that is licensed and calibrated through our weights and measures program. So anytime you take a box to uh, the postal service to weigh it and have it shipped, that scale actually has been inspected by the Department of Ag staff. Your gasoline, we inspect gas pumps to make sure that you get a gallon if you pay for a gallon kind of consumer protection type of thing. And so when it comes to anything cannabis related, these are the places where ODA has a role to play in conjunction with directly regulating hemp. So back in 2014, the federal government passed um, a farm bill that said that states can have pilot programs either through the state land grant university, which would be Oregon State University here in Oregon, or through the state Department of Agriculture. OSU wouldn't touch it for very good, understandable reasons. Um, and ODA uh, took that on. We're required to register the growers, so they have to tell us where they're going to be growing. They send in uh, GPS center point locations for either a field or a greenhouse. And they have to have that crop tested no more than 28 days prior to harvest to ensure that the THC levels meet the, the state standards. Now in 2018, there was a new farm bill that was signed that actually took hemp and all of its derivatives off of the Controlled Substances Act and sets up a hemp program at the US Department of Agriculture. So this is now a nationally legal agricultural crop. It doesn't mean that everything is in place yet um, I've heard people joke that a year in hemp is like a dog year, right? So we've got things compressed and things are moving quickly. And for some people, they're not moving quickly enough. And for others, they're moving too fast. You know, this is a new industry and I don't think we've had a new industry quite like this, um, in a very long time in the U S. And so we are all trying to get our feet underneath us and figure out which end is up other than we know how to grow agricultural crops in this state. And it is one more in the 220 some odd agricultural crops that we grow. In Oregon, we also require that the initial processors have a registration with the department, that's a handler. So anybody who is making extracts or concentrates because pretty much 100% of hemp grown in Oregon currently is for the CBD market, not for the grain or fiber market. Um, some people are using this medicinal hemp um, the same as they would marijuana, and so they also smoke the flowers or buds. So anybody who is making a retail-ready product in that way, flowers, buds, pre-rolls, would also need to have a handler registration with the department. Once it goes to a retail store or it's been turned into an extract or concentrate, those that continue the secondary processors are not required to have a registration with the department through the hemp program. Now, if they're making a food item, it's the same as any other food item and they would have to have a food safety license, et cetera. And then, um, because until last year, hemp did not fall under Oregon seed law, we also have an agricultural hemp seed registration that goes along with a grower or handler registration. So if you're growing seed that you're going to sell to somebody else to plant, then you need to have your grower registration as well as the ag hemp seed registration. Or if you are a seed dealer or seed cleaner who's taking in seed from other growers, cleaning it, removing any weed seeds, any dirt clods, et cetera, and then selling it, you would need to have those two registrations. It is now part of our seed regulatory program in the state of Oregon, and our seed program is, is reaching out and starting to work with the hemp industry and bring them into compliance so that you don't have you know, somebody walking up with a baggie of seeds saying, this is the best seed we've ever seen, and you as a consumer kind of get screwed over, right? Our seed law is also another consumer protection requirement within the state. 
I am going to be really clear that the authority that the state legislature gave the department in regards to regulating industrial hemp is pretty minimal. They made it an agricultural crop. We meet the requirements of the federal law, and we cannot go beyond that. It's popular. Um, somebody asked me to give a State of the Union address recently, and I put this slide up and said, you know, they asked me to talk about where we've been and where we're going, and I put this slide up and said, I could show you this and drop the mic and be done. We started in 2015 with 13 registered growers and about 105 registered acres. We are currently, as of Monday, at just over 1,900 registered growers and just over 62,000 um, registered acres, which includes both outdoor and some indoor greenhouse grows. Uh, we are probably second or third in the country for registered acres currently. And we continue to receive registrations as we get to the end of the year. It's a calendar year registration and we accept those throughout the year. So if somebody's growing indoor, they can still be applying to get those registrations right now. And it's more than tripled since last year. We ended 2018 with 584 registered growers and just shy of 12,000 acres. So it continues to be popular. I think um, a couple of reasons might be it's much easier to grow a very similar plant under the hemp program for those who might be struggling on the marijuana side. And with the removal from the Controlled Substances Act, we have a lot more traditional farmers who are looking at hemp as a possible rotation crop. They know how to grow a crop. Why not grow this as one more in their portfolio now that it feels more legal and there's a clearer path forward? So I'm going to leave it at that for now. I know that you are going to have a lot of questions. Um, these short URLs, URLs, and those of you in the back can't see them, but it's like oda.direct slash cannabis. That has a number of handouts, kind of like that one infographic that I showed at the beginning that talks about our ag water quality program and how it relates to cannabis, how our food safety program, weights and measures, and pesticides all relate to cannabis. If you also go to oda.direct slash hemp, that has a lot of resources and a Q&A. And then the bottom one, if you go to any ODA webpage, you can sign up for our hemp email list. At the bottom, you'll see a box that says subscribe. It asks you to put your email address in, and that is how you can stay up to date on any changes within the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next one is Jake Johnstone. And are you guys doing a combo or one? All right, then it'll be Scott uh, Ciciliani, both Oregon Water Resources Department and Josephine County Water Master. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Fowler, for the opportunity for us to do a little presentation here. Now, this is going to be a very truncated presentation. Uh, generally, when we talk about water rights, it can take some time. So um, Scott and I are going to try and get through this uh, as uh, hastily as possible to free up time for question afterwards. Uh, so as Commissioner Fowler said, my name is Jake Johnstone. I am the region manager for the Oregon Water Resource Department. That is Coos, or for the southwest region, which is Coos, Curry, Douglas, Jackson, and Josephine counties. All right, uh, Scott Cicilline, District 14 Water Master, encompassing Josephine County. I'm going to start off with a little bit about water rights. Just something real basic here: the waters of the state belong to the people of the state. Those waters are managed by the state, specifically the Water Resources Department. Surface water and groundwater, if you wish to utilize. In the state of Oregon, you need to have a water right apart from a few exceptions to that. So
So the 1909 Oregon Water Code ha basically has four carve-outs, four broad carve-outs, and we're only going to briefly touch on this. But uh, number one here, beneficial use. The use that you're applying for in your water right must be qualified as beneficial use. So you can read into that irrigation, municipal water, industrial use, that kind of thing. Uh, nursery use, which has been a big one as of recently uh, with cannabis and now with hemp. Uh, priority. So for those of you who are not familiar with the regulation process for a senior call for water, priority is based off of essentially first in line, first in time, or first in time, first in line. So a senior user makes a call for water claiming that they do not have enough water at their source to meet their agricultural need associated with their water right. Our department goes out, validates that call, and then we create a regulation sheet based off of junior, years, junior use upstream that can be regulated off to meet the needs of the senior user. Number three, a pertinency is basically, what it means is that every water right has a specific place of use in which you can utilize that right. Whether it's for irrigation or for nursery use or domestic, there's a specific location that you need to utilize that right with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Number four, water rights must be used. A water right must be used at least one time beneficially in five years or it becomes subject to forfeiture. That same uh, being subject to forfeiture, that same five-year period goes back 15 years. So 15 years ago, there was a five-year period in which you didn't make beneficial use at least one time. You're still subject to forfeiture. And some common misperceptions regarding a pertinency. There's a belief that a water right would change with the changing of landholders. That's not the case. Uh, as you can well imagine, a lot of water rights were associated with large parcels of land. Uh, let's say you had 200 acres, it was subdivided over the decades. Uh, our department does not issue a new certificate until a modification has been made to said certificate via a transfer process or uh, in-stream lease or something along those lines. Uh, so that's that impertinence, pertinency factor uh, plays a significant consideration when we're talking about anyone who's interested in getting into this business for the first time is doing their due diligence on water rights associated with a property and wants to make sure they'll have access not only to the place of use, but the valid point of diversion. So you gotta make sure you have access to whatever the source waters are as well. Okay, hemp in the state of Oregon, from our aspect or from us, our standpoint with the Water Resources Department, we view hemp the same as any other agricultural product or crop. A hemp registration is not a valid water right. A little bit different there. Commercial agriculture requires a water right or other legal source of water. And there are a few legal sources of water which you can utilize on those commercial products. And I think that's, uh, that bears a little repeating. Uh, you heard Sonny say that from the Oregon Department of Agriculture's perspective, hemp is another agricultural commodity. Uh, that is being grown in the state. From the Water Resource Department perspective, it is the similar case. We do not grant water rights specific on crop type um, other than cranberry bogging, which is a very specific uh, industry and a very specific process. I, I am not aware of water rights that are crop specific in the state of Oregon. Uh, so as far as we're concerned, any transfer, um, you know, any new water right application, the crop type isn't going to play a factor on whether or not that gets granted or denied. Uh, it also does not, it does not create how we go out and, um, you know, prioritize our complaint load. We take our complaints as they come and we go out and validate and do what we can to work through that process. Uh, just real quick on the hemp numbers, um, you know, Sonny had that slide there that showed it's popular. Well, it is popular. It's very popular, um, especially in the Rogue Basin. So uh, the Southwest region, again, that's Coos, Curry, Douglas, Jackson, and Josephine County accounts for around 45% of the greenhouse totals for hemp registrations, the last time I checked, uh, which was in June, and a, about a little over a third of the entire acreage associated with hemp production in the state of Oregon uh, is in the Rogue Basin alone, which is a pretty significant total when we you know, consider areas like the Willamette and some of these other areas that have larger irrigation footprints. So. So I just briefly wanted to touch on the breakout for the state. So the Oregon Water Resource Department is charged with managing waters of the state, as Scott pointed out. Uh, we have 21 watermaster districts covering the entire state. The vast majority of those watermaster districts 
are what we call lone wolf water masters. So you've got one water master like Scott here uh, covering a significant amount of acreage, uh, irrigation, that kind of thing. Uh, we do have some uh, assistant water masters in different areas in different districts. Uh, but the vast majority of our field services is a one-man show or a one-woman show. Um, specific to the southwest region, uh, you have Scott, so our District 14 water master covering Josephine County. This is a position I held before Scott. And now I'm region manager for the southwest region you see there. And Siobhan Haynes, who is the District 13 water master. Uh, I know it gets tossed around county water master, I'm the Josephine County water master, I'm the Jackson County water master. I just want to make it clear that this is a state run program uh, and just it's that the district lines oftentimes mirror county lines. Uh, and we do have good working relationships with our counties and therefore that, that, that name is kind of a misnomer but we're, Scott is the District 14 water master serving Josephine County. Um, some other little tidbits I wanted to add here towards the end is just in understanding Josephine County water right data, there are 4,136 individual water rights in Josephine County. There are 5,235 individual points of diversion. There are 46,163 irrigated permitted acres in Josephine County. There is 1,640 square miles. And there are 8,217 miles of water. And in that, I'm including um, seasonal creeks and canals, but that's still a place our water master gets called to. And there's one water master. Jackson County has 200,000 acres of irrigation, 8,100 points of diversion, 5,800 water rights, and almost 17,000 miles of water. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big job and it's a lot to tackle. Um, and that's about it for Scott and I right now. I, I, we kind of blasted through that, and I know there are probably a lot of questions about water. We have some publications over here on the table um, that I encourage you to grab if you have not done so already. Um, and then if you don't get a chance to get to us in the question and answer session, uh, one of us will try and stick around a little bit afterwards, but we'll see how long the meeting runs. Um, and that's it for us. Thank you. Next up is Bill Meyer with the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Bill Myers with DEQ. Um, out of the, I work out of the Medford office. Um, my, I'm, I'm going to also go through this quickly, uh, leaving time for questions uh, at the end of all the presentations. Um, also, what I talk about here, I've got a handout, um, and I'm going to put that over in that resource area over there. Um, so my focus um, is non-point source pollution, and I'm going to go over how um, DEQ deals with hemp, you know, what our jurisdictional overlap is with hemp, as it would be with any other agricultural crop. Um, I work on non-point source water quality issues, so those are issues that are not covered under a permit. This is not wastewater treatment plants. It's not the end of pipe. Um, the issues that we would encounter associated with, with hemp or other ag crops um, would be complaint-based. So we are complaint-based. We respond to complaints. Um, the type of complaints that apply um, the list is right here, and I'm going to go through these one at a time. Um, pesticide, storage, and, di and disposal would be an issue that DEQ would address um, that's improperly stored or improperly uh, dumped, uh, improperly washed containers um, associated with pesticides. Um, that's an issue. The photo here, um, that is pesticide storage. Um, in a pump house. So that's not where you want to store your pesticides, not to mention bad housekeeping, you know, that needs to be cleaned up. Um, the next issue that, that DEQ addresses would be construction-related erosion. 
Um, that would be associated not with the agricultural crop itself, but outbuildings or roads that go in to service those buildings. Um, those are activities that are not related, they're peripherally related to the grow, but they're not the agricultural operation themselves. So that is, that is an issue um, when soils are improperly stored or disturbed close to a waterway where that silt and sediment is gonna get into waters of the state. Um, waters of the state, just the definition of that, um, would include you know, creeks and rivers. It also includes lakes, wetlands, as well as the ditches that run along the roads that do connect to a stream or a creek. Uh, next issue, um, vegetation, riparian vegetation removal. Um, I work in Jackson, Josephine, and Curry counties. All three counties have riparian protection ordinances on the books. Um, so these type of activities where you're, you're cutting down um, trees next to a river, next to the Applegate, um, or where you're dumping debris, could be you know, vegetation, could be lawn clippings, could be trees, you know, any kind of debris, that's not allowed. Um, for DEQ, we would work in concert with the county um, as well as ODA on enforcement actions associated with cutting down trees along creeks and rivers. Uh, solid waste dumping. Um, so this is solid waste um, associated with ag or anything else. Prohibited materials are not allowed to be dumped. That includes these tires. Uh, the center one is just really bad housekeeping. Uh, the one on the right um, is asphalt shingles. These things are not allowed. You can't dump them. You can't bury them. They need to go to a proper waste hauler um, to be disposed of properly. Uh, open burning. Um, so that is, that's burning. No burning of prohibited materials, uh, which include, you know, we go back to asphalt shingles and, and household residential garbage. Um, but also, if you're burning associated with agriculture, it has to be during times when open burning is allowed. Um, at the beginning, I talked about complaints. We are complaint driven. Um, there's a complaint hotline, which is a telephone number, um, or a, a website for DEQ. Um, that's going to be on this handout as well as up here on the screen. Um, so, those are for complaints that are associated with DEQ pesticide application complaints, because again, DEQ deals with the hazardous waste, you know, the dumping component. Um, application questions can go to PARC, it's the Pesticide Analytical Response Center, and you can Google that, or there's the number right there, or the website. Um, again, that'll be on my handout as well. So, um, yeah, that's what I've got for this evening. Thank you. All right, next up from Pacific Power, we have Christina Kruger. Can you hear me? All right. So hi, I'm Christina Kruger, the Regional Business Manager for Pacific Power. I represent Jackson and Josephine County, and some of you may be wondering why I'm here. Well, I'm here because one of the things that I do is I oversee you know, large, <laughs> large requests for energy um, and work orders that have to do with people trying to expand and, and basically obtain, you know, more service from us. And so there are three real important things that I want to talk to you about today. The first is what does that process look like? Why is it so frustrating to work with Pacific Power? What can I do to make that a little bit easier? So that's one. Two, um, what's available to me as a business owner? Are there opportunities for me to save money? And yes, there are. And then three, um, we're calling it a rates revolution. And that's a little bit more about how we charge our customers, what those rates look like, and what we're thinking about um, in the near future. So let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about is if you're coming to us for a new load request, what that means is you want to either start a new service with us or expand on your existing service, there are essentially two pathways for us to meet your need. The first pathway is going to be for someone that has an energy um, need that is going to be one megawatt or more. That's pretty substantial. Typically, that's going to be a greenhouse. Uh, those processes are pretty extensive. And the reason why is because it takes 
about four different types of engineers to take a look at our system, identify what those impacts are, and then, maybe I should breathe, uh, and then from there, we identify what equipment you need, what the costs associated with that are, and then what the timeline is to get that to happen for you. So that's a pretty long process, but I tell you, in order to speed that up, you need to come to us with as much information as you can possibly get around what is your energy use really going to look like. And sometimes we push back. Sometimes based on the history of the customers that we worked with in the past, you can bring information to us. We kind of know that it's off. And we want, we want you to re, um, take another look at those numbers. And the reason being is if those are as close to accurate as possible, you're probably going to save money. You're probably going to save time. Because frankly, some of those uh, larger pieces of equipment can take a year to get here, six months to get here. And when you're thinking about harvest and planting and all these other things, that's just a pain in the butt. So we get that. Another thing is the other process. So that's the general service process where it's less than a megawatt. You're working with our local estimators. I don't typically get involved in those, but it's still kind of a tedious process. It's a first come, first serve. That's something that a lot of people don't understand. They reach out to us and they say, okay, well, my name's on the list. Well, if you didn't have all the information and someone else comes in uh, after you but has all their information and they're ready to go, they just bumped you out of the line. So please note that. Try to get as much information as possible early on so that we can help you all the way through. We don't want to be an obstacle to your growth. Let's see. So that brings me to number two. Number two is you guys are running a business. We want you to be prosperous. That's incredibly important. You're a part of our community. And so there are advantages for businesses, and those are things like energy uh, efficiency incentives. So there are so many available to you. You may not be aware of it, and I know that a lot of people are moving really, really quickly because, you know, this is an exciting time for you. But there are so many advantages to kind of reaching out and knowing what those resources are so that you can save money up front. So when you're pulling, putting those plans together, please make sure that you take a look at what incentives could be available to you. I have information here to provide you should you have any questions about that and want to know, you know, how can I save money on lighting or pumps or any of those things. The third thing, I'm trying so hard not to cough here. Oh, okay, so the third thing was our rates revolution. So what that means is we're taking a look at our customers. We're seeing that they're changing. Their energy use needs are different. And what does that mean? We're looking at you know, rates and regulations that were established so many years ago that are really antiquated. They're old. They don't really line up with how we use energy anymore. So we're hoping to start to make some changes in what that looks like. And what that will mean in the future is things like we'll probably be lowering the rates for people that are using energy during times of uh, greater availability of energy. So like maybe for solar, solar peaks during the day. In the past, we would ask people to use less energy during those times of day. Well, if we're, we're essentially generating cheaper power during that time of the day, it might be more beneficial for our customers to use more energy then. And so, you know, you're going to start to see a pendulum shift here for our customers. Thank you. I'm, I've been sick all week, so I'm trying not to cough on this thing. And I think that's actually it. So <laughs> oh, I hope I didn't talk too fast. Thank you. Go ahead. Take your water. You earned it. Um, Daniel Van Dyke of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, Mark, can I have a glass of water? Can I? So my talk, my talk's a little bit different. Um, I'm going to talk about fish, what fish need from water users, landowners, and regulatory agencies. It's a little bit different talk tonight. And these photos chronicle the life history of steelhead. And the Rogue is iconic for the steelhead this river has produced uh, over generations. Um, uh, obviously, the eggs, the, the fish lay the eggs down in the gravel, deep down in the gravel. They incubate for two or three months, depending on the water temperature. They hatch out as little tiny fry. Again, two to three months. And then it takes about two to three years to get to the size of that beautiful steelhead in the upper right. That's a juvenile steelhead found in Cane Creek in Gold Hill. Uh, that is a survivor. That's the kind of fish that'll survive the trip to sea, 
to come back as that adult in the lower right that we all want to have, both for uh, uh, our personal enjoyment, the, the aesthetic of keeping these fish around, but also for the economy, economic benefits that fishery and fishing provides. Um, a lot of people think all we need to do is release billions of these little fry and we'll have fish coming out of our ears. Couldn't be farther from the truth. We gotta have fish surviving for three years in the streams and, and rivers of Josephine County to be able to have fish that survive and have the best chance to make it the trip out to sea and come back as adults. Help us grow survivors. We need stewardship uh, from folks to, to produce those fish that survive. Oops, the wrong way. So a lot of people call ODFW and, and kind of think that we're uh, uh, kind of a state environmental protection agency. And we're, we're not. Uh, we work with the authority the legislature has granted us to regulate uh, habitat and rules that we implement. And this is kind of a, a list of, of what really would be reasons to contact ODFW. I'm going to talk about the items in, in yellow really briefly, but uh, obviously another one, if, if you want to learn about fish, learn about fish and wildlife needs, uh, uh, what you can do to, to benefit Oregon's fish and wildlife species, that's obviously another reason to contact us. But first we'll, we'll talk about fish passage. So ODFW does regulate fish passage in the state of Oregon, actually predates statehood. Um, new dams, new culverts uh, need to meet fish passage criteria uh, before they're, they're constructed. Changes to existing dams or existing culverts can trigger ODFW fish passage rules. So there are very specific ways and things people need to do uh, to be able to provide fish passage in the course of doing your, your development. Uh, there are, there's also a process too um, if, um, if it's not gonna be possible at a single uh, development site to go with uh, uh, an alternative. But what we see typically, and culverts are, poorly placed culverts are the most insidious problem for salmon and steelhead uh, I think that's ever been invented. Um, this uh, picture in the lower left is an Allendale Road box culvert, a uh, trip of Larson Creek, a trip of Bear Creek in Medford. Pretty typical about box culverts that are undersized. We get some big storms, they scour out underneath, and pretty soon you can imagine little fish migrating upstream, uh, try and jump at that, and they don't stand a chance to get upstream with that jump uh, onto concrete like that. In fact, you could watch during storms, you could watch little fish jumping at this very culvert uh, if you time it right during storms in the fall. And that goes for any culvert barrier all around uh, the two counties, uh, all around the state of Oregon. But I need to mention other things know that little fish uh, jump at these culvert barriers. Predators, mink, green heron, blue heron are all sitting there picking off our wild fish at these barriers that we placed in the way of their migration. One other quick thing on fish passage. Uh, see the one, the photo on the lower right? I don't know if you can tell. This was a situation where the culvert was undersized to begin with. Well, what do you do? What, what do some people do when they have an undersized culvert? They add another undersized culvert. And that is the wrong thing to do. It doesn't meet fish passage, and it really sets you up for big problems like washing out of your road if you don't do it right. And believe me, I think this county knows what we're seeing with increasingly extreme weather. You gotta oversize your culverts and your road crossings because the weather's coming. So you gotta be ready. So ODFW also regulates screens at water intakes. Um, and this is all about keeping fish in the water and not on the egg field. Pretty simple. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a pump screen on the upper photo, and then there's a paddle wheel screen that's pretty typical on ditches and such, where we have ditches for irrigation. Uh, bottom line is any new water right as of 1990 has to have a fish screen, and older rights over 30 CFS have to have a fish screen. 
and there are other rules in place. But uh, we have a, a screening and passage program, a shop here at our office, and they can help with any questions uh, folks might have on, on how to design a screen for fish. I do want to add, we still have large unscreened diversions in the rogue watershed where we lose wild steelhead. They're, they're killed every year uh, at those unscreened diversions. Another thing that ODFW gets, we get calls to, uh, quite a bit asking, are fish using my stream? Are they present in my stream? Well, that's actually not the right question to ask because if it's on the valley bottom, fish will be present at least seasonally on every single valley bottom stream throughout this watershed at least seasonally, unless we block them by poorly placed culverts or dams or other such. Um, so really, the, the question you should ask is, if there aren't fish present, why aren't they present in my stream? And I just wanted to show they can be pretty small little water bodies that are used by fish. This is military slough, a trip of the rogue, uh, and we would regularly uh, count five, 600 juvenile steelhead and coho going upstream, this little tiny trip, every winter probably more than that. Uh, doesn't take much, but fish definitely use these smaller streams. Uh, just really briefly, if you happen to see a uh, hazardous spill, uh, there, there have been multiple times where, where folks don't know who to call. I mean, obviously, one place to call is, is DEQ's office. Um, but if you happen to see a spill, not just you, you think something could be happening, if you see it, there is a hotline in the state of Oregon. That's the Oregon Emergency Response System. And there's the number. And I wanted to show, this is a photo from Ashland Creek where uh, somebody saw these dead fish on a Saturday, didn't know who to call. We didn't hear about it till like the Monday or Tuesday afterwards. It was too late to do anything. Uh, if there are a bunch of little dead fish in flowing water, that's trouble. Uh, and uh, I would recommend calling oars. Um, I was just going to say my last slide that uh, fish need, without doubt, need cold water, clean water, riparian vegetation, native trees and shrubs, large woody debris. They have a lot of habitat needs. They rely on agencies um, implementing rules to protect that habitat. If you want to make a difference, remember that agencies are uh, complaint driven and don't let agencies off the hook, including mine. If, if there's a problem, if there's a violation you've seen, Please report it and please follow up um, uh, and make sure you get an answer to a, to a habitat violation. Um, and if you don't like the law that's being implemented, you don't think it's sufficient, I totally encourage you, please contact your elected officials. Um, water resources uh, is such a critical com component for fish. They don't have enough staff. That's something that folks need to hear about around the state. Uh, with that, I will. Okay, next up is Lauren Brown, the Department of State Lands. All right. Good evening, everybody. So Department of State Lands is one of those agencies that Dan was talking about that's supposed to protect the habitats, the waterways and the wetlands. Um, we regulate waters of the state. I don't know if our definition is exactly the same as water resources or not, but it's almost anything that holds water. So rivers, streams, uh, lakes, wetlands, ponds, some ditches. Um, we, for waterways, we regulate to the ordinary high water line. For wetlands, we regulate to the wetland boundary. Uh, we are, uh, we base removal fill on volumes, so we have volume thresholds. So for most wetlands and waterways, you can move, remove and fill up to 50 cubic yards without a permit. But if it's a waterway um, or wetland considered essential salmonid habitat, um, that threshold is zero. And that is almost all the main waterways and tributaries in Josephine and Jackson County. And don't forget, um, the U.S. Army Corps also regulates uh, waters in these counties, but they're called waters of the U.S. Uh, I'd also like to point out that 
you do have to work with a lot of different agencies and I understand that can be difficult for the public. So make sure just because Water Resources tells you you can do something or ODA tells you you can do something, the Oregon Removal Fill Law is still applicable and that's for us too. We all try to meet and coordinate but um, there's a lot of people you gotta get in contact with when you're working in wetlands or waterways. Uh, we do try to promote um, notification. Different counties and cities are required to submit a wetland land use notification to the department. Anytime someone's proposing ground disturbance on a tax lot that has wetlands or waterways on there. So that's one way for us to reach out to people. Um, we are also shorthanded. I currently cover Douglas, Jackson, and Josephine counties. <clears throat> For hemp, um, it's considered to the Department of State Lands as an agricultural product. Um, we do have a lot of agricultural exemptions. Uh, a lot of irrigation ditches are non-jurisdictional, which means we don't regulate them, but you have to see the specific rule for that. Um, it's, uh, they have to be, it can't be a captured stream and it has to be shut off seasonally. Maintenance um, uh, or reconstruction of water control structures is usually exempt, but that maintenance and reconstruction definition is very specific. It's not just general maintenance, general reconstruction. Um, so make sure you um, call me and check to see if that activity is exempt or not, or if you need a permit. There are quite a few agricultural activities that are exempt. Um, Push, new push-up dams that are for agriculture. Um, they have to be less than 50 cubic yards in salmon habitat. Uh, normal farming and ranching activities is limited to converted wetlands. So that's um, planting, rotating crops, the normal stuff you do um, in agriculture. New subsurface drainage is limited to converted wetlands. Um, I worked in the Willamette Valley a lot, so I understand you guys are probably not trying to drain your fields down here, but um, I have been to a site in Josephine County um, that was a big natural wetland, um, and they were wanting to convert it to hemp. You can't do that if it doesn't meet the converted um, wetland rule, and that means it's a wetland that was farmed prior to, I think, June 30th, 1989. It's been hydrologically manipulated. It doesn't have natural wetland vegetation. You know, it's something that's been continually cropped over time. So a field that's full of sedges and rushes and spirea with standing water, um, you cannot ditch and drain that and convert that to agriculture without a permit. <clears throat> uh, and then there's other activities associated with agriculture in, um, where it also raises that zero cubic yard threshold to 50 in some of the salmon water. Uh, essential salmon habitat, we abbreviated ESH. So, to, so if your project isn't exempt, your activity isn't exempt, um, and you're going over that threshold, then you have to apply for a removal fill permit or a general authorization. Um, some activities are streamlined um, through our general authorization process. If you do have to get an individual permit or a general permit, that's often going to require a wetland delineation, a functional assessment of either the wetland or waterway you're impacting, mitigation and monitoring, which is probably the most expensive part of um, getting a permit. And then there's also a public review period where adjacent landowners and anyone else who's asked to be on a list will get notified of your project. Another way we handle things if, if something's been done without a permit is through enforcement. Enforcement is mostly complaint driven. Um, so I get calls from people like you. I get calls from other agencies. Um, I do a lot of, I spend a lot of time on Google Earth. Um, I see stuff from the road, um, but I can't see everything in all three of my counties. So you can call me, you can remain anonymous, um, I'll investigate that. 
um, that usually if I if I can if I feel like there's a definite um, enforcement case there I'll contact that landowner set up a site visit and we'll figure out how to um, bring them into compliance or restore the site I put questions up there but I think we're holding off for that so thank you for your time Next, from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, we have Mark Grenbemmer. Good evening. Thank you all for coming out today. I know it's uh, a lot to give up a, a Wednesday evening to come sit in a room and listen to a bunch of people talk at you. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Josephine County Commissioners for putting this meeting together. There we go. And I did bring my own water bottle because, Christina, I get the same thing. My voice, I, I, I get dry throat really bad. Um, I'd just like to say I've actually learned a lot, and I've worked with most of these agencies for way too long. And so do I get to ask questions as well? One. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, so my name is Mark Grenbemmer, and I'm with the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, and I'm located out of Medford, Oregon. I actually have a little cube in the DEQ office that they're kind enough to uh, um, to rent with me, or to rent for to me. Um, so Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board is a fairly new agency. We were formed in 1998, and if you remember around that time, there was a bill for parks and salmon. It was a, uh, a bill that would uh, basically give 15% of lottery funds to uh, support uh, state parks as well as, um, at that time, kind of responding to the coho, the listing of the coho salmon. And so if you buy lottery tickets, um, seven and a half cents out of every lottery ticket goes to the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, which we then invest in folks that are doing voluntary watershed restoration efforts uh, in Oregon. Our primary delivery mechanism is through watershed councils and soil water conservation districts. So here in this area, if the names, uh, the Applegate Partnership and Watershed Council, the Rogue River Watershed Council, Illinois Valley Watershed Council, Illinois Valley Soil Water Conservation District, Jackson, S D Jackson Soil Water Conservation District, Two Rivers Water Conservation, Soil and Water Conservation District. Anybody heard of those groups? Good. <laughs> so while we fund voluntary water or restoration, um, we primarily work with councils and districts as kind of the delivery mechanism to help put those projects together. And those entities work with most of the agencies that you're going to hear from tonight. So Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of uh, Agriculture, Water Resources, et cetera, um, are really great resources for helping if you want to try to undertake some voluntary restoration. Um, Dan was kind enough to share, show some examples of some projects that uh, we funded in this area, um, projects around fish passage, um, riparian planting, so tree planting along streams and rivers. Um, we also work with agricultural producers um, to kind of find alternatives to their um, issues, especially if they're around uh, fish passage or water conservation. So an example of a project we might provide funding to is if there was a person that had a push-up dam that was impacting uh, fish passage and was also impacting water quality, um, we would work, uh, the district or the council could work with that landowner and the agencies to put together a project to find an alternative to that push-up dam and possibly uh, also find ways for that uh, producer to uh, use the water more efficiently. So a lot of folks um, you know, may be doing flood irrigation and, and through the project help could possibly uh, convert over to a more efficient sprinkler or other high pressure system. So. Um, the funds, like I mentioned, that we get are, are through the lottery. It's a open, it's a competitive grant program. So, folks work with our with the districts and councils and the agencies um, to put together projects and then submit them to us. We actually do a, a technical review and then make uh, project awards based on that. Um, we just had a, a grant cycle, 
and um, which is about a six-month period. At the end of the, uh, this cycle, we'll be making uh, statewide an award of about uh, $7.8 million to support watershed restoration projects, and we do that uh, twice a year or four times a biennium. So that is all I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have afterwards. I guess the, the punchline is, oh, we have, while we don't have any regulatory authority over any agricultural products or any jurisdiction, we do work with producers to help find uh, solutions to alternative or solutions to issues that might be impacting uh, their waters or, or their stream health. So. Okay, next up is our own director of Josephine County Community Development, Mark Stevenson. Thank you, Commissioner. And Mark, I want you to know I buy lottery tickets, and so you can't lose if you don't play. So. so I am Mark Stevenson. I'm the director of community development here for Josephine County. I also am the building official for Josephine County. Uh, we deal mainly in land use, building codes, and how they relate to industrial hemp or agricultural products. Um, development standards and permits are required for all hemp agricultural products that go in. Josephine County Community Dev Development is made up of building safety, land use planning, and code enforcement. I wanted to touch on rural residential properties because those seem to be um, most prevalent right now and people growing hemp on those properties. The Josephine County Code, um, you have to have a development permit for structures that go on those properties, um, but it is not required for agricultural products, but you are required to meet the minimum standards of our development code. Those standards include a single family dwelling on the property, on the residential use. It includes setbacks from all property lines. Uh, farm uses shall not interfere with adjoining residential properties. Farm uses shall not constitute a sanitation or health hazard. Fences, walls, screens, flood hazard, building size, heights, and among others, those are all part of the development code. Um, extraction of any kind is prohibited on residential property. And uh, residential really is the most restrictive uh, property the girl on as far as hemp goes. Hemp production in the building code. New and existing structures require a development permit. They require building permits. Um, if you have a residential property and you want to have a commercial hemp operation, then any structures you use within that property are going to have to go through a change of use from a residential use to a commercial use. Uh, the code is pretty extensive for that, but we have a means of um, having exceptions for agricultural structures, which exempts you from the building code. Uh, it doesn't exempt you from plumbing permits, electrical permits, mechanical permits, and such. Uh, so all the electrical, mechanical, plumbing, uh, anything installed has to go through a licensed contractor in the state of Oregon. So the, our biggest concern out there right now is the ethanol extraction. Uh, it's prominent medium for the in industry, and it's using extract oil from the hemp plant. Ethanol is considered a class 1B flammable uh, liquid and therefore must meet specific fire code and building code concerns. Um, we currently have plans and review for an extraction plant, which includes uh, approximately 3,600 gallons of ethanol on site, both within the building and on the exterior building. So there's a lot of um, uh, codes that have to be addressed, including fire code. The state fire marshal has to get involved. Um, it's doable, not on residential land. On other properties, it is. I mean, we've taken people through the process on the marijuana side, on the THC side for extraction, and uh, we're extremely concerned right now about where all this hemp is going and if there's any extraction facilities out there working without permits and such. This is one we found um, here in the county. This was made in China, brought here, it was being assembled. It doesn't meet any of the standards for the United States at all. 
And luckily we found it before it went into operation. It's been dismantled now and removed. Removed to where? I'm not sure. But it was uh, pretty extreme. It was in a very uh, uh, dangerous building. It was in the middle of a community. And uh, luckily we were able to uh, get ahead of this one. So there is a big concern there. Uh, code enforcement, we um, are proactive in the enforcement of all county codes and law. Uh, we expect Oregon Department of Agriculture to oversee their own registered growers also when we find a violation on the property um, and hopefully help us abate those violations. And again, we're talking about setbacks. There are some properties in the county that you cannot grow hemp on. Uh, not very many, but just a few of them. And so if we find hemp on those properties and they are a registered grower, we're going to reach out to ODA and we're going to um, ask them for assistance in, in directing their clients on the right path. So whether it's corn, tomatoes, or cannabis, community development is here to assist in the land use and building codes. Um, We've been doing it for several years now with the marijuana industry. We've kind of got our feet wet, and we're, we're pretty straightforward now with what we need to do um, and how we can help you go through the process, get compliance, and get your uh, development going, get your businesses going. Uh, so we're, our main goal is to protect um, the health and safety and welfare of the citizens of Josephine County as they use the structures and as they use the property. And there is immense power when a group of people with similar interests get together to work towards the same goal. So any questions you have, I can answer. Also, I have my email over there for future questions. All right, well, unfortunately, um, Sheriff Daniels, uh, one of his deputies, was involved in a vehicular accident, so he won't be able to make it tonight. Uh, Oregon State Police also had an, an issue with the presenter, and so he's not gonna be able to make it, but let's, last but not least, Richard Roseberg from OSU, the Southern Oregon Research and Extension Center. Well, good evening. Quite a quite a string of folks here tonight, uh, and a, quite a crowd. Thank you very much for coming out, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I am the director at the uh, Oregon State University Southern Oregon Research and Extension Center in Central Point. Uh, we're the main uh, hub for OSU activities in Southern Oregon. Most of the faculty and staff that work for OSU in Southern Oregon are located at the Research and Extension Center in Central Point. There are some that are here strictly in Josephine County. I know Sarah Runkle was here tonight, our horticulture agent. Um, and so we do have a few folks here at just the Josephine County office. But what, what, what Oregon State does is basically uh, based out of our, our mission uh, as or Oregon's land use, land grant university, we are involved in three things, resident education, and that's when students go to Corvallis to campus to get their degree. We're involved in research, studying agricultural and natural resource issues in the communities around the state, and involved in extension, which is to take information that we've learned from our own research and from other folks' research and, and, just, and uh, take it out to all the citizens of the state so that you don't necessarily have to go to campus in Corvallis to get the benefit of, of OSU research. So unlike most of the folks that have spoken tonight, we uh, have no regulatory function whatsoever. Most of the folks that have spoken tonight can, can uh, encourage you and force you if, if push comes to shove to do a certain kind of activity. And if you persist in disobeying the rules, they can shut you down in some cases. We can't do any of that. I can't tell you to do anything. Uh, folks at OSU, all we have is the ability to do research, trying to solve problems, and to present that information to you, whether it's in classes or whether it's in community forums. Sometimes we testify when regulations are being developed and that kind of thing. So I kind of like that, the fact that nobody has anything to fear from me because I can't shut you down. However, I do hope that we can persuade you to do uh, uh, better actions if there's some kind of a problem. So in regards to hemp specifically, um, you know, OSU was, has been involved in hemp uh, like other agricultural uh, crops in a way for a long time. There was a, an OSU hemp 
center from the 1880s until the 1930s that looked at hemp and flax and other fiber crops. Back in those days, fiber was kind of the emphasis. And so that, of course, got shut down when, when cannabis was, was uh, made illegal in the 1930s. But so we have sort of a history of being involved and interested in this, but obviously not a whole lot of recent activity because it's been federally illegal uh, to even basically say the word cannabis up until very recently. However, it's interesting to note that there, that there are uh, faculty in at least 19 departments um, that have an interest in working on hemp and an expertise, people in pharmacy, people in engineering, as well as people in agriculture. And we're starting to see that now that the 2018 Farm Bill was passed and decriminalized some of the activity. And OSU has been very cautious in getting into this, but we see the size of the ag industry. We see this, the things that are going on, and we, are, we need to be involved. And there are a lot of folks like myself that have had an interest and been reading and doing things that we can do on our own time and our own money, but and now we're actually able to talk about it in public. So professionally, that's that's kind of exciting to me. What other another more recent thing that OSU has done is um, created the Global Hemp Innovation Center just in June. Dr. Jay Noller is the director of that to try to coordinate OSU's activities in research and extension and to interact with other universities in other states as well. Um, OSU began a seed certification of hemp uh, just in, in July. That's been a strong point of Oregon agriculture. Seed production in general has been a strong point in Oregon agriculture for a long time, and OSU's seed certification is one of the leading uh, seed certification universities uh, in the country. So the rules for hemp and things of how, how um, uh, seeds can be identified, how their genealogy and heritage can be uh, identified Again, so that there's a there's a good knowledge and an openness about the genetics of plants and not the details of how those were developed, but when you're buying a bag of seed, you know exactly what you're buying, that kind of thing. This summer, we sort of uh, put our toe in the water as far as field research. There was a small hemp research trial on 11 of the branch research and extension centers around the state, like the one here in the Rogue Valley. There's 11 of those around the state. We, we had a very small experiment this year. Um, but we admit that we're sort of behind the curve in terms of practical experience because we have been prohibited from really dealing with it directly. So we're in kind of the strange situation where we have a lot of expertise, you know, in plant genetics and agronomics and soil science and, you know, plant breeding and all these kind of things in general. But in terms of a practical experience with hemp, we are, we are behind the curve. So we're, we're, the goal is to take the expertise we have and to apply it, apply it to the needs and the questions um, that growers have uh, as, as we move forward, just like we do for any other crops in Oregon. So we still have to work within the federal regulations. Many of the rules are being written by USDA, FDA, DEA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of excited and confident that here uh, in the very near future, even even uh, us at OSU that are very risk averse because of the federal laws will be able to fully engage. So we're, we're thinking, of, we're hoping to have, a, for example, a, a variety trial uh, next year, a hemp variety trial and some other things like that. But in the meantime, we are taking questions, we are answering the best we can, and we're using those as a guide to uh, help understand how we can help and the things we really need to be working on going forward. Thank you. Okay, if I could get that nice lady to turn on the switch that's behind you on the wall. Get some more light in here, thank you. Um, let's take a quick four minute break. Last chance to get your question coupon separated. And then let's get back to our seats and get ready to uh, ask a few questions. All right, uh, if you drew a ticket, uh, would you migrate to this side? And we'll, Annette will be, uh, with the microphone for those who want to ask a question. Um, also, I want to remind you that uh, we have some very knowledgeable presenters up here, and so would you treat them with kindness? Let's not attack them. Uh, uh, some of the words I pulled out of their presentations was uh, understaffed, underfunded, and lots of activity. So let's keep our expectations reasonable. Um, and like I said before, the main... 
Main gist of this event is to connect you up with them. All their emails are on a piece of paper over there. Please make sure you get that. It'll be available uh, through my office, through the commissioner's office, if not on the website, those, um, those contacts, and so that you can follow up and get right answers to your questions. So, Lily, you want to pull a couple of those? and. I'll take it. I won't drop it, probably. Hey, wait a minute. It's made for my grandson. Uh, it's a very small neck. Okay, get them all out of there just to make it easy. Uh. Right, my grandson probably would have just dumped it instead of reaching his hand in there because he's one of the smartest people in the world, even though he's only five. Um, okay, so these first two, let's have uh, 898 be first. That's 898, and then 902, let's have you be second. 902, uh, I have two 902s here, so that's very interesting, skip that, uh, 896, 896 would be the second one up, thank you, all right, sir, please ask your question, uh, uh, can you hear me okay, yes. Uh, Sonny from ODA. I, I was hoping that you could give me clarification on uh, pre-harvest testing. Uh, I recently received an email from the department and it said I must start harvesting within 28 days of the pre-harvest test. And then I talked to my two lab technicians who come and take a pre-harvest test and they tell me now you must finish this pre-harvest test uh, very quickly. One even told me by the 28th day after the pre-harvest test but I said uh, your information was different so could you please uh, elaborate on that as to how long we have to test uh, I mean, how long we have to harvest after the pre-harvest test? And can we get a second, I'm sorry, one more question. And can we get a second pre-harvest test on another lot or group of plants? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a relatively easy question. Um, so thanks for starting us off light. The rules are pretty open-ended, and so our policy is that you must start harvesting in earnest within the 28 days after that sample is pulled, understanding that if you are harvesting by hand, you may not get it all done within the 28... <laughs> wow, I didn't think it was that exciting. Um, Pay no attention to the space sounds, sorry. Wow, um, so you have to start harvesting in earnest if you um, decide, okay, I'm, I'm gonna harvest part of the field and then I want to wait longer than the 28 days and harvest the other half, you would have to get a, a second um, pre-harvest test done. Um, but if you're going to be harvesting in earnest, you're out there, you're working that field, you're pulling those plants off, that initial sample will qualify for all of the plants in that field. Right, you can't pull one plant, wait a week, and pull another plant, but get out there, work on it, you're good to go, as long as you start by that 28th day. You do not have to complete it within the 28 days. You're welcome. Well, she's the one that's gonna answer half of these. Um, <laughs> let's see. I was at, that was 898, I had 896 was next, and then 900 even. So 896, never made it up last time, 900 even. 892, I can start making up numbers, that's a real number, 892. 895, we finally got a winner, 886. Is there an 886 out there? I really pictured this going a lot smoother. Anyone else? Um, and last one is 890. 
Still can't get any takers. Would you please line up on this side if you have a question? Um, please have your, go ahead and answer, ask your question, ma'am. Hi, um, my name is Christina Lefevre and I'm with Pollinator Project Rogue Valley and I do not grow hemp, I don't intend to grow hemp, I voted for hemp, I support it, I have a purse that's made out of hemp, this might be hemp, I'm not for sure. I'm concerned as a citizen and as a pollinator person about what a lot of the grows are doing in the valley. If you're a small grower and you're doing the right thing, I'm not talking to you. Where I live, I see huge fields, relatively speaking, that have been scraped and there's plastic laid down. The plastic is another issue. I'm not talking about that either. What I see when I drive past there is I see nothing there except a huge cash crop. And I'm concerned with the, all the acreages that are happening that no one is thinking about the other creatures that live here, specifically in the winged ones, the pollinators that we all need for our crops that we do eat and that feed other insects and other critters. And I would like to question if anyone has proposed thinking about having a requirement yeah, I know, I hate that word too. Having a requirement that there be some sort of land set aside, I don't actually care what you're growing, whether you're hemp or whether you're growing tomatoes, that says that you as a grower need to think about this valley and this country and have some pollinator plantings and habitats set aside. Because if we don't... Thank you. Because if we don't do that, we're all gonna be eating rice and toast, and I guess we'll be happy because we'll have wine and hemp, but that's gonna be about it. So I would like us to consider having a requirement, and 10% may sound like a lot, but if everybody did 10%, then everybody would be the same. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, I didn't quite hear a question. Anybody have any th hear anything in there they wanna address? Okay, next. 886, we have a winner. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, late season uh, pests, uh, oils, and other other pesticides. I wonder, maybe Sonny, you can address what uh, what is kicking hemp uh, in the post harvest samples uh, and the processing. What, what is kicking the what, what materials are kicking them out of the uh, out of compliance? <clears throat> well, my question is essentially: um, Are there pesticides in the flowering cycle that you wouldn't want to be using uh, for aphids or mites or things uh, that are, you know, would, would uh, keep your hemp from being in compliance. Yeah, let's, let's talk about pesticides a little bit. So geek definition, pesticide being anything that kills, repels, or mitigates a pest. So we're talking insecticides, fungicides, rodenticides when we say pesticides. There are very few pesticide tools that are available to legally use on any form of cannabis. The reason being the federal government, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, regulates pesticides and does risk assessment for active ingredients on foods that we eat, particularly um, important here because we do consume products from hemp or marijuana. And so we have a situation where um, the State Department of Ag has set up criteria for what products are not illegal for use on cannabis. And remember I said for us, cannabis includes both crops. So our first criteria is the active ingredient has to be exempt from the requirement of a tolerance. So if you're thinking about an apple, and this is true whether it's organic or conventional, the EPA looks at that chemical and says, okay, how much are you likely to consume over the course of your lifetime? Is that same chemical gonna be used on other crops that you eat? Is that same chemical gonna be used in this building to control insects? And they're gonna take all of those routes of exposure into account and they're gonna set long-term chronic health exposure levels for consuming that over the course of your lifetime or being exposed to that chemical through those other routes as well as acute for say somebody making the application and they set what they call tolerances or residue levels. When you harvest that apple, how much of that chemical can be left on that apple? They have not done any of those risk assessments for hemp or marijuana. 
So the Oregon Health Authority established a list of 59 different pesticide active ingredients that hemp and marijuana are tested for. They looked at historical black market use of certain chemicals. They looked at what was available and likely to be used by people because of mites or other um, typically insect or fungal diseases because that tends to be what um, cannabis is susceptible to. And they came up with that list. Currently, very few hemp, um, either raw plant material or the extracts or concentrates have tested positive for any of those 59 pesticide active ingredients. So in, in the case of hemp, I think I've seen maybe one or two come in in the last year. Cor correct, or even a detect at all, because those action levels, um, the, the levels set by the Oregon Health Authority would keep it out of the marketplace, but if the lab has levels that they test for low enough that they can detect it, they are required by state law to report that to the department. So I think maybe out of those two or three, one of them was out of compliance. Yeah, so very few. It's a long-winded answer for very few. You're welcome. All right. The next one I pulled had uh, something written on the back. What is the testing protocol for THC and and pesticides, you kind of hit uh, pesticides, but what about THC? Is there, like, I almost think OSU, how, how close are we getting to some sort of test that'll uh, be the roadside test, like with cocaine or heroin or something where it turns blue? Yeah, let me address that. Um, so in Oregon, I, I established that you have to have your hemp tested for um, THC prior to harvest. Currently, that is for Delta-9 THC, which is the intoxicating form of THC. The new farm bill says that the definition of hemp is for Delta-9 THC, but then they, they go on to say that um, the states will have to have a method to test post-decarboxylation. I hated chemistry. Um, a bunch of you probably hated chemistry, but there are different forms of THC that are in the cannabis plant. And the acid form, when you heat it, converts to delta-9 THC. And so when they talk about decarboxylation, they're talking about heating that and converting that THCA to delta-9. So we are waiting for the USDA to put their rules out so that we know exactly what they are going to require starting next year. We anticipate that it's going to be what we call total THC in Oregon, which is how everything is tested post-harvest and how marijuana is tested, and that is the total potential for intoxication of that material. Um, as to the roadside test, current law enforcement has kind of what you're talking about, but it's really a presence absence. Is there THC there or not? And the legal definition for hemp is 0.3% or less. It doesn't tell them that. That is why hemp is a difficult thing for law enforcement right now because the law is ahead of what they have. There is a company in Europe that has developed a similar test. It's basically a reagent. They put the material in there, kind of like if you were testing for pH, they shake it around, and if it turns a certain color, it's going to be at the 1% level. And quite honestly, if it's 1% or less, it is not worth law enforcement's time. So that is what they are looking to and testing currently in Oregon. OSP is working on that. Um, they're working with groups like Port of Portland. Anytime Port of Portland confiscates some material, they're using this test to see how it works and then also taking that same material to a lab that quantifies it. I don't know how long it's going to take them before they feel confident using that um, but it is being worked on and is getting closer, and other states are testing similar uh, methods for their law enforcement as well. And Thank I think you. these two have been waiting yep. for a bit. I, uh, I'm fully changing over from the ticket method to the line method, so if you, you've pulled a ticket and you want a question, please get in line here. Um, sorry about that. I wanted it to be random. Now it's first person in line. Please. Hi, my name is Cassie. I was wondering for farmers that have planted multiple strains um, that are going to finish weeks apart even, uh, some finish way earlier than others, what is the recommendation as far as the pre-harvest testing goes for those situations? So when you're ready to harvest each strain, 
you need to have a test no more than 28 days prior to that harvest. So folks who are doing autoflower, for example, have already started. They have their test. They harvest within 28 days. The rest that are dependent on daylight are going to have it sampled now and start harvesting within 28 days. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, my question was just kind of in regards to uh, regulating the amount of THC allowed in hemp. I think a lot of farmers, um, with how the industry's at right now, there's not, uh, you know, seed suppliers with really good reputations. And so you, when you're buying seed from someone or buying clones from someone or cuttings, uh, whatever it may be, there's a lot of concern with, okay, I see a COA they may have that shows this is under this percentage, but how do I know my plants will be? Um, and I think it would take a lot of stress off of farmers if there were a buffer area, because when you're growing a hemp strain, if it has 0.9% THC, that's still not marijuana you're going to sell in a store, and it's still very rich in other cannabinoids. So is there any way, would be my question, that we as a group of like a coalition of hemp growers could help to influence laws in our state? Absolutely. And I, and I agree with you 100%. Like I said, in the case of law enforcement, 1% is not worth their time. A um, lot of other countries, too, have gone to the 1% standard. And so I don't know if it's something we can model as this would be the prime time since we're right. starting our program. I think it'd be really comfortable for farmers and it would help to increase the, the uh, I don't know what the word would be, but basically the comfort that farmers could have planting a crop knowing, you know, if it goes over 0.3, I don't have to destroy it. And also, my question um, was with isolate can you use a hot field uh, and isolate that CBD out legally? Yeah. So let's address the, the above 0.3 piece. Um, not all countries have gone to 1%. Most EU countries are actually at 0.2. Um, so we, we do have to be aware of that, and we have to follow whatever the USDA comes up with. The USDA is going to be putting those rules out for public comment. That is an excellent place for you to get involved, as well as with our state legislature. Um, because ODA has to regulate to what the USDA and our state legislature tells us. And right now it's the point three. So that would be a place where, where you could definitely get involved. As to remediating a hot crop, the law does not allow for that. And that would, again, be some place that you could go to the legislature and say, if it's up to 1%, we'll go ahead and allow you to harvest it, but it has to go into the extraction, you know. Yes, that's been talked about, but it's going to have to get through the legislature for us to be able to enact that. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Seligman, a 24-year resident of Josephine County. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank Commissioner Fowler for providing us this opportunity. Josephine County, and I wanted your opinion on this. Josephine County is having a hemp boom right now, and I'm for anything that increases the prosperity. Uh, however, uh, Josephine County has the largest percentage of hemp grows increase and the, and the largest percentage of decrease in marijuana. A lot of this is due to county commissioners' regulation over the past two years, which many have been forced to go to hemp. So now we have water issues, we have land use issues, far beyond what we had with marijuana. I want to know, since the county commissioners kind of put us in this situation, what, are, what can we do, what can the agencies do to uh, ameliorate this problem of abuse that can happen with improper use of land use, which is far beyond anything we saw from marijuana? This is a pro I'm not blaming the growers. I'm blaming county government for creating this situation. So what can we do as citizens, and what can you guys do, because I know your enforcement capabilities are minimal, and what will you do? Will you discuss this with county officials and say, hey, look, this is what you created? And again, I thank you for coming here tonight. Yep. Um, anybody want to tackle that? It's almost sounded like a political commissioner question, uh, more than a uh, what are the rules and regs. Yeah. And so it's we do get blamed for quite a bit. This may be one that we will be blamed for in the future, but uh, I think it's a problem that Oregon did not know the unintended consequences, and I'm surprised they didn't learn it from the first round. Um, and so now they're going to have to go back and put some more rules around it, and I think they will as a state as time goes on to make the industry um, flourish. So uh, next. Hello. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for sitting up there 
and listening to our questions and taking all this in. And thank you for the information you've been giving us. My, my question is rather rhetorical, but I, I do actually have a question. Um, I want to point out first all the people that have been hurt from not having water regulations component on the ODA application for hemp. We have food farmers, wineries, the fishing industry, our endangered salmon, medicinal cannabis, THC growers, and every single person who uses water in every county in the state of Oregon. And I believe there are no excuses from any of you agencies to have not stepped up and figured this out, how to affect the use of water. And I, I just know you have the information. You just need to figure it out and do it. And so my request is of ODA is to immediately shut down the licensing, hemp licensing process and um, until you can put a water regulation component on the application. Thank you. So ODA does not have the legislative authority to do that. What we are doing is looking at ways that we can provide additional resources to the Oregon Water Resources Department that does have the authority to follow up on those water resource concerns. Uh, we're looking at ways to fund a staff member in Water Resources Department that can look at ODA's list of registered growers and verify if they have water resources or not. It is that agency's authority and expertise to do that. Just because somebody puts on the application that they do or don't have water um, rights doesn't mean that ODA has the expertise or authority to double check that. And I'll turn it over to Jake if he has anything additionally to add to that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. Um, right now it is a, a commodity. It's an agricultural crop in the state of Oregon and much like many other crops, it doesn't require a verification of source of water. Um, you know, we're, we're doing what we can to get out there and verify water on properties that we get notified about and properties that we see that may or may not have made agricultural use in a while and doing what we can to work with ODA on getting data on hemp farms and that kind of thing. Uh, but it is, a, it is a big lift and we're doing what we can to get out there to those places. I do want to note though, if you look at 2015 stream flow numbers, they're about where we're at right now. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new crop and we had this issue with wineries when they first came into the area. Uh, we definitely had it with cannabis when it went legal in 2015. And now we're feeling this with hemp as well. And I think that, you know, part of it is a workload. Part of it is cooperation between our two agencies to try and address this as we move forward. Because as has been said before, we're setting what happens moving forward for this whole industry. Uh, but there are a lot of moving parts in that. And uh, we're just doing what we can to get out there and try and validate source of water on these properties on a case by case. So. Well, no, just one question, if you would. I just wanted to add that Carl Wilson is heading up the um, the push for uh, hemp advisory board of sorts at the state level that would actually be considering what the legislature could do. And he only gets to introduce one or two bills next spring. So we've been trying to push him to for, uh, keep pushing to form that board so that they, there would be a place to take these um, issues with to try and get the legislature to change, which I think is the, the method. So next. Hey there, everybody. Thank you for the information. Good luck with your hemping, everybody. So now during the first part of the uh, presentation here, there was a point of emphasis in the fact that most of the crops being grown are going to be extracted. Um, now, when that product gets extracted, just from previous knowledge I have of extracting material, that, you know, CBD product where is 10% CBD, 0.2% uh, THC, as it gets refined, even in a crude process, it's going to multiply somewhere in the five times range, which is going to make that product 
50% CBD and 1% THC, which would at that point uh, make it an illegal product in the system. So in order to protect the farmers and the economical um, ecology of the situation, if you will, how do we protect people in that situation processing the oil downline and make sure that this thing keeps pumping and everyone can prosper through the system? So actually, it's not necessarily true that it becomes a marijuana item um, when that THC is concentrated. Um, under the hemp program, as long as it's not sold in the general marketplace, so outside of the regulated marijuana program, and it doesn't cross state lines, we do not view that as a marijuana item. We do have a situation where there is a separate criminal statute where it talks about if it's above 0.3, it can only be sold through OLCC stores and it cannot enter or leave the state. And so those two um, regulations are somewhat in conflict and we have a situation in Lynn County where local law enforcement is viewing that differently because the company probably did ship stuff across state lines and then local police came in and, and tested everything there. So I anticipate that the industry is going to take that to the legislature to make it very clear that that intermediate product, as long as it started out hemp and doesn't do either of those other two things, is still hemp in its processing. Yep. Okay. All right, anyone else? Yes. Hi, I'm Daryl Jackson. I'm from Williams. And um, I pay a lot of attention to the water, and it was interesting to hear Jake say that the stream flows are very close to what they were in 2015. And if you were to draw a cartoon version of that, it pretty much looks like this. The stream dries up through the summer season, but the important part is down here in the corner. The stream flows are extremely low right now, and any further illegal extraction from the stream just really could push this whole hydrology right off the edge. And so it was interesting to hear Dan say we need to not let the agencies off the hook. And I'm asking that all the agencies remain on the hook and we come up with a solution to this. A good friend of mine didn't come to this meeting because he said you aren't going to resolve anything. And so I would like to, is something that's kind of been missed in all this, and I wish a lot of the people hadn't left, but could I see a show of hands of everybody in the room that kind of thinks that the situation is out of control? The hemp industry is out of control. And my question would be, would the agencies work towards a model program here in Josephine County that could establish it like the hemp commission that Senator Wilson was talking about to put a control on the industry, not just for next year, but for this year. So if people are stealing water this year, possibly a local ordinance that would fine those people. So I'm asking if the agencies would buy into that. Uh, so a couple of things there. The data from the Williams gauge that Mr. Jackson provided us with recently, um, that happened to be after a rain event, so it wasn't really as damning as it may look. Um, every year, Williams Creek gets down to about two to seven cubic feet per second. That's on just about any irrigation year we have. So that usually elicits regulation, which I talked about in one of our slides, based for a senior user, and then we go up and we shut off uh, users upstream. We try and track down illegal use, that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's kind of the system that we have in the state of Oregon with water, uh, with water law, the way it's been allocated over time, water rights, and then in-stream water rights for the fish, uh, which in some basins there are old in-stream water rights, which we do regulate for, and in some basins the senior water right may be an irrigator, uh, which is the case in Williams. Um, as far as uh, Josephine County, I think part of this is that, right? It's creating the dialogue. Uh, I work out of Jackson County as well, and I know that Jackson County has a cannabis group that meets monthly. Uh, there are industry representatives, agency representatives, and we have the dialogue. And as has been said multiple times up here by, by a number of us, it's getting involved in that legislative process that brings about rule changes, that brings about policy changes, and that kind of thing. Um, 
I, I think Mr. Van Dyke is very accurate that it's good to keep us on the hook. And if you have a concern, please do keep bringing it to our attention. Um, I'm not going to lay the excuse that lack of staffing. We're doing what we can to get out there. Um, but it is something where we need to be reminded of certain things, and you need to keep that dialogue going. Uh, but as far as a, a fine system, our department does have an enforcement wing. We do have the ability uh, to assess penalties uh, up to a class B misdemeanor and some financial fines as well. Uh, but we have to go through the process of validating the illegality of use. Uh, far too often we get anecdotal stories of there's illegal use up there. Uh, we do not have the right to trespass. We cannot walk the creek unless it's a navigable waterway. So it's a misperception that a water master can just saunter on up the creek and drag pumps out of the creek. Um, so we, we're doing what we can with that. And I do appreciate you making that comment, and I do encourage you to stay involved in that dialogue. So, Very good. Um, looks like we have three people standing left. If you guys can keep the question short, I think we can answer all three, and then we'll have to cut it off. Yes. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Let me uh, give a chance on that last one. We had a... I just wanted to chime in just really quickly. The, the one concern I have is comparing to 2015. 2015 was a declared drought in Josephine and Jackson County. It was a third year of, of drought. Uh, so I have to be honest. When I hear uh, that flows are at that level, that's, that's a level where things are pretty extreme for fish survival and fish persistence. It, this is, though, ultimately a legislative issue. Uh, we absolutely do need to make sure Water Resources has the staff capable to respond uh, and, and make sure things are, are uh, flowing smoothly for poor pun. Yeah, flowing smoothly. I get it. Um, next question. Okay, so um, my question basically is like as a potential new um, hemp farmer, like is there some t type of a specific plan that I would go look at and say, okay, well, I need to do this step first, this step, make sure that these agencies are okay with this and that and the other thing on this property, you know what I mean? Uh, so that way... So that way I could get things going, running smoothly from the start and not have a bunch of agencies coming at me and, you know, saying I'm doing everything wrong, you know, and, and you know, or if, if also this kind of ties in with it, if there's a, um, an agency or somebody to talk to, say, for like what pesticides are approved, like specifically organic pesticides, if any, or, or, um, or other regulations like that that have to do with the pesticides. And, and so that's basically it. Right. It sounds like he's asking for like a one-stop shop or a list of things he yeah. has to check off. Yeah. We don't have it yet. Um, but I always tell people, OS, uh, OLCC on the marijuana side has their business readiness guidebook. And the various state agencies put the information in there about what you would need to do to meet those requirements. A lot of that is going to apply to hemp as well. So that's a good place to start, and we're hoping to kind of copy that and make a, a hemp-specific version. And then the pesticides, that's through the Oregon Department of Ag, and we do have a web page specifically for cannabis and pesticides that has the list of products. You'd have to look at those and work with an organic certifier to determine if they would be appropriate for organic production or not. But it is available on our website. So if you didn't catch the, the web address, you can send me an email, and I can send you that link. Very good. Thank you, sir. I'll just touch on a little oh. bit on the structures you use, sir, on your property and the use of your property. You're going to want to come to a community development and just talk through what you'd like to do on your property, and we can just assist you through there. Thank you. Next, second to last. Uh, so, yeah, so just the, uh, one of the last guys was uh, talking about your percentage going up uh, after concentrating, and I um, noticed on the website there is uh, uh, you have your pre-harvest test, and then you do have post-harvest tests and flower tests and then concentration tests and then end product tests, and then I think that if you got a concentration test, maybe you don't have to do the end product test or something like that. But um, if you guys are aware of the concentrates causing the percentage to go up past that 0.3 uh, mandate, then what is um, – going to constitute a failed test uh, under those post-harvest tests? So the, the state doesn't require a potency test on the crude oil. It, it pesticides and residual solvents if solvents were used.
so your the company buying from you might want a potency test. So if I'm going to make lotion and I'm buying, you know, oil from you to incorporate into my lotion, I'm going to want to know the potency so that I can dilute it down so that my final product meets the 0.3 requirement. But the state does not require that that intermediate product be tested for potency. Is that going to stay consistent after the federal laws? Yeah, so the USDA only addresses the growing of industrial hemp. FDA is the one that is going to be addressing those other pieces. And currently right now they basically say that you're illegal anyway if it's going into a dietary supplement or a food item. Um, so, yeah, it's all, it's all a big gray area. But right now we don't anticipate changing those rules on our end. Yeah. All right. Last one. Hello, thanks for coming. And um, I'm a resident, uh, a residential homeowner out in uh, just in, in uh, Illinois Valley, and I'm now surrounded by acres and acres and acres of hemp. Surrounded, and so my question: I'm hearing a lot of like we don't have the resources to follow up. We there's a lot of rules about us making sure that people have water rights that they're actually using water that is they're allowed to use that doesn't belong to the fish and don't shouldn't be in my well and shouldn't be on my garden. Um, and my question is, um, there's a lot of incentive to, for, for people. People are making a lot of money, a lot of money. And the, the question is, how can I, as a resident homeowner, hold people accountable? Who do I call and how do I do that? How do I be your eyes and who do I call and make that happen? Because it, I'm, I'm, I am pro-hemp. I'm more pro-water. And I would love to see us be more reasonable about this. If you're in Josephine County and you have a complaint that you'd like to file, you can contact me, the watermaster. I'm more than happy to go out and look into those situations to validate if there is a complaint there or a violation. And we go down the process of, of, of dealing with that issue. Um, you know, typically we go out, we'll work with the landowners to try to gain voluntary compliance. If that's not something we can do, we then go down the path of civil penalties or fines. And it's it's a matter of time. It's a process, like everything else. We do. Uh, no, go ahead. We do accept anonymous complaints. A lot of people say they don't want to file a complaint because they're worried that their name's going to be out there. Someone's going to find out and file the complaint. You can file an anonymous complaint, and your information will be redacted in certain in situations where it would come to light. I was just going to mention that uh, uh, I work with a bunch of agencies that put together a resource list specific for Josephine County for all the agencies and contact names and numbers. I didn't bring it tonight, um, but if you call the uh, ODFW office, I can get that to you at 826-8774 and extension 234. Uh, I know some members in, in Williams have that, that list, 8774 and extension 234. Okay, and those phone numbers are available. Um, I tried to cut it off at 745. I got two more guys. You want to go two more? Two more quick questions? Yeah, let's go two more. Yep, who's first? Oh, they're together forming one question. Okay, perfect. Um, so my main question is related to safe, responsible, and legal use of fertilizers on EFU zoning. I believe this actually will overlap building, planning development, DEQ, ODA, maybe even fish and game. So <clears throat> um, we've had a situation trying to deal with uh, fertigation tanks on our property. It's a FEMA zone site. So we have done flood studies. We need to get structural permits for tanks. Um, we are trying to figure out with ODA registered products where we fall in with DEQ, storing use of fertilizer on site, and how to be in full compliance with all of you. Okay, it is working now. Um, anybody want to talk on that subject? From a DEQ perspective, um, you know, you don't want to store any chemicals in a place where they may or they're likely to enter waters of the state. 
Um, in terms of the construction of a storage area, is is that a land use issue permitted by the county? Right. It absolutely is, yeah. And we're looking at Anchorage to keep the tank from rolling over, and, and normally an engineer is going to be involved in that also. From ODA's perspective, fertilizers aren't registered in regards to environmental or human health. They're re they're um, registered for consumer protection so that when you buy triple 16, you actually get triple 16 and they've been tested for heavy metals. So we would not have a role to play in this situation. Yeah, and there's no specific DEQ permit required either. Um, it would be a land use issue in terms of the location of the storage facility. Yep. Uh, one thing, if you're going to be doing inline chemigation or fertigation and those lines are connected to your water supply well, you have to have backflow prevention on there. The Water Resource Department does cover that side of it. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than a, than a check valve, but we can chat about it if you want afterwards. All right, very good questions. Thank you all for coming. Please grab a carrot stick or something on your way out. We have free reusable grocery bags over here with the new county logo. And grab that contact list and start asking the questions. Even if you ask the wrong person, they will help you get to the right person. So thanks again for coming and have a good night.